how's it been progressing with support from all over the world particularly from the scientific community which is very important you're based in new york or here i thought you're ba- here i'm based here but i'm doing a broadway play in new york <laughs> whenever i'm in new york i wouldn't miss a broadway play but in the last 3 uh, years i haven't seen one so closing that gap by sh- you know showing what's behind the curtain showing that's part of what yes. i think this campaign is about like but with this aspect definitely we need to open the curtain everybody is talking about solar energy yeah. we are harnessing solar energy better than yeah. most people when you call soil dirt we all become dirt bags isn't it <laughs> Well, well last time we we spoke we we talked about the ecological issues and and raising awareness around what's happening with soil degradation and we touched on specific to two things that are of interest to to both of us which is specific to the African continent geographically um but also uh African people and folks um in America um So I think maybe that's a great a good place to start to really mm-hmm. make it uh palatable for for people how does it practically a- affect my life. See uh it's good that you mentioned that because when this food crisis begins to happen which is estimated will start somewhere in 2030 and progress towards 2045 in a serious manner. The first place on the planet which will go through enormous suffering is Africa. because africa is in a situation where desertification has reached or soil degradation has seriously affected 45% of african continent and it's estimated by 2050 two thirds of africa will be in the desertification process in the last 50 years the 30 wars that have been fought in africa which have been criminally cruel kind of wars 27 of them were fought for control over agricultural lands mm-hmm. the somalia famine that happened i'm sorry the sudan famine that happened recently 260000 people died in that 50% were children below 6 years of age because children and the older people are the first ones to die and uh, when children die in front of you you not being able to feed them what people go through is indescribable okay so the pain of that lives with people and makes them more and more disabled so by the end of the century african population is supposed to go up by 3 billion it's right now 1.2 or 1.3 billion it can go up to 3 billion at the same time produce food production in africa if nothing if business as usual happens if no changes happen food production of africa will reduce itself to 30% of what it is right now you can imagine that horror mm-hmm. so when the, that horror unfolds in that continent in the past many types of horrors have happened man made and other kinds of things have happened when that happened the first thing that happens is the world isolates itself from africa they are not on the news nobody sees it if 10 people die here everybody sees in the world and everybody is horrified there is a certain value to people seeing these things and saying this should not happen but in africa when it happens people die like animals and nobody sees it the rest of the world barely sees it there is a lack of infrastructure also and there is also a strategic aspect to it unfortunately it is there so even this unfolds the way it is moving right now according to the prediction of every scientist these are not astrologers these are scientists making calculations mm-hmm. if it unfolds the first and foremost people who will get the maximum pain is the black people in africa next will be probably certain parts of asia so here also when it hits north america maybe north america is far more organized compared to other continents sure. so because of that this may come little later but when it comes the first population that will be affected is definitely african american american population there's no doubt about it when covid happens they are the worst hit when anything happens they are the worst hit right. for variety of reasons yeah i think that when folks are living in urban environments it's one thing to touch and feel agriculture i see it as part of my life as part of my landscape as how i raise my food and um uh, and sustain my family 
it's a little more obvious the impact of agri- of agriculture. But when you live in urban environments that are entirely cement, yep, um, there's a de- there's a detachment from how does that impact me? That thing I see on screen on television, who who cares? I get my food from the grocery store. <laughs> I don't I don't see you. There's there's a detachment there. Um, so I think it's important for folks to. Somebody was telling me, Sadhguru, but the generation Z thinks the food comes from the superstore. Yeah. I said, when you say Generation Z, that is the worst thing, that means it's the last generation. Yeah. <laughs> Please yeah. don't ever use the word Generation Z. And the moment you think it comes from superstore, that it doesn't come from soil, then that's the most serious mistake we're making. Educating our children is important, but more than educating our children, it is time as democratic nations, people stand up and say, this needs to happen. The reason why it is not happening is, democracies have their beauty and their problems. Sure. The problem of democracy is, it is there is a, uh, a kind of a phenomena called short-termism. Because you elect a, a party or a person only for four years or five years at the most. And most of them come to power after their 60, 65 years of age. Mm-hmm. Why would they take up something which takes 20 years or 25 years to produce results unless people really want it? I am very empathetic to the political leaders of any class, of any kind or ideology, whatever, because they are all fighting for their own survival, because the nature of political life is such, today you are on top of the game, tomorrow morning if the election results say something else, you become extinct, you vanish and disappear of absolutely no significance. This is the only career like that. So when you have a career like that, you tend to do things to please people immediately. Uh, You definitely ascribe to short-termism. Long-term thing, if it needs to happen, people have to say, if you commit to long-term well-being of this nation and this world, we are with you. This is why we want to move 3 to 3.5 billion people on the planet, so that political leaders will feel comfortable investing on long-term well-being. And the uh, and the the uh, electorate, the people can digest it and understand that we are invested in a long yes. term strategy. One of the things that's so difficult about uh, the multi pronged um, system of oppression that folks are, are experiencing, especially Black folks uh, in America and otherwise, is there's so many moving targets and problems, right? Mm-hmm. Whether it's policing or housing or uh, education, etc. So your your energy, which you already have very little of, because it's incredibly expensive and taxing to be poor. You're, you're already low on resources, but you have to pay attention to this, play this game of whack-a-mole on all the things that are oppressing you. So then if something comes up that feels long-term, yep. that feels like a luxury item. I'd, lo- I'd love to care about that, but I've got to get my kids to school. I've got to avoid violence. I've got to find a way to put food on the table. I've got to do all this. How do I... So that's one of the... One of all now our, that you, our you mentioned food on the table as the last one, I want to make that the first one. Yep. And a connection. Food on the table. If the food has to be on the table, the food has to come to the uh, four, you know, on the floor of the shop. If it has to come on the floor of the the shop, it has to be on the farm. If it has to be on the farm, there has to be rich soil. So that is the first priority. There are many issues. I'm not saying they're not important. There are many issues. They're all important. But the most important thing is fundamental life, isn't it? It is. I think... People, we have to maintain the connection to means of production, like an understanding of the means of production. I know when I see a video of violence against my people, I can see the source. That guy did that to that person. Our food, it, people don't have, we don't, we hide labor. Hypercapitalist societies, <laughs> we hide how labor actually occurs. Yes. So you don't see what the people It's a shiny like. product. I just Who made phone. it shine? Just give, me the, just give me the iPhone. I don't need to know all the children that work for it, how the people that were exploited in Uganda, whatever, to get to get the result. So closing that gap by, you know, showing what's behind the curtain. Showing, that's part of what yes. I think this campaign is about. Like Definitely looking. we need to open the curtain because this is, this is not an audience. The, the food and us, the relationship right. is not that of a play and an audience. An audience need not see what's behind the curtain. Right. They must see what is there on stage. That's all their business is. Right. But here, we are the consumers, we are the people who, for whom this is being done. If we don't see the whole process, we will regret it in a serious way because every responsible scientist in the world is clearly saying by 2045, we will be producing 40% less food on the planet and our populations will be over 9 billion. 
It is not a world to live in, believe mm -hmm. me. That's it is not a world to live in, 2045 is not too far away. Right. It feels like it was just a minute ago we were talking about the year 2000 and now we're in 2022 almost, mm -hmm. halfway there to 45. Um, uh, I, I also think when you think about food on the table, especially in urban environments, what people are eating, what they're consuming, what they're putting in their bodies, um, plant-based diet. You know, I think about it's becoming more and more popular to talk about. It's certainly a growing business. <laughs> Um, and people are sampling it and realizing, it, you know, it's not as scary and foreign as they, as they might expect. So, yeah, I think uh, you, you're going all over the place, uh, traveling uh, yeah. uh, UAE and the other parts of Asia and everything, but you're hopping the most important place, which is India in between. Yeah. Why I'm saying this is <laughs> because in India, even today, nearly 47% of the population is fully vegetarian. Right. And another 25-30% of the population is non-vegetarian in the sense they will have some non-vegetarian meat or fish or something as a side dish probably once a week mm -hmm. or maybe once a month. Mm -hmm. So they call non-vegetarian. Mm -hmm. But there's nobody eating a full steak anywhere in India, okay? Mm -hmm. Certainly not every day. So, yeah. this is not something new. This veganism, this vegetarianism is not something new. We've always lived like this. It's because of that we managed our soils well for over 12,000 years of agricultural history. Mm -hmm. We managed our soils well. Only in the last 40 years we've ruined it with the so-called idea of modern agriculture, mm -hmm. unfortunately. But for over 12,000 years we've been farming the same land and keeping it very, uh, you know, rich. Mm -hmm. But we have destroyed it now because of advice that we get from the labs, not from the land. Right. Where do you think that's going to, we're having the most momentum? What part of the world are we seeing a willingness to shift that we can use as an example to get some momentum? Uh, in southern India, we've been running this for the last 22 years and we have shifted hundreds and thousands of farmers to tree-based agriculture. Now in Africa, it is becoming a momentum, but not enough in a few countries because when we say Africa, people are thinking of it like one country. Yeah. It's a continent with, you know, dozens of countries. So, uh, it is not like you can change Africa. You have to change Uganda, Nigeria, this, 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 many things, okay? Mm -hmm. So, the northern part of Africa, nearly 45% of the continent, you can see it's turning brown. Yeah. This is very dangerous. This is not only dangerous for the African people, it is very dangerous for the entire world. Absolutely. Uh, right now, 60% of the African people live in rural areas doing subsistence farming and things like that. But it's estimated by 2050, 64% of African population will be in urban areas. Can you imagine the condition of those urban areas when this bigger population moves to urban areas without any infrastructure? Mm -hmm. What happens there is uh, not something to imagine. Is there a, a universally agreed upon response to this des desertification? Oh, yes, definitely. How do we stop this descent of the Sahara yes, Desert? Yes, yes. See, uh, when you say universally agreed upon, in principle, yes, but in actual application, it's different depending on the regions, the temperatures, the atmospheric conditions, the, the agricultural traditions, the latitudinal position in the planet. Accordingly, it's different for different regions and also the soil types. Mm -hmm. So, uh, it, the, in application, it's different. In principle, it is same in the sense, see, organic content comes from only two sources either from plants or from animals. Either green litter from the trees and plants mm -hmm. or from animal waste. This is the only way. There is simply no other way, okay? You, nobody can produce organic material in a factory right. or there is some technology because I'm stressing on this because in California, whenever I start talking, people say, my friend has started a new startup. We are coming up with a new app. Yeah. You can do whatever apps and stuff. In application, there can be technology. But in fundamental, this is all it is, you need to produce organic content. Right now, you just see any farmer, largely, most farmers, are they producing any organic content on their land? Because it's machines, there are no animals, there are no trees, where is organic content? They may buy some manure from somewhere. How much manure will you transport from uh, miles, hundreds of miles? Right. That's not going to work. For your land, what organic content you need? that many trees and that many animals must be there. The machines don't give out any waste. The waste that they give out is poisonous. 
it is not enriching for the soil. Mm. Mm. Uh, I'm, I'm to put it asking. simply, I'm saying the tractor doesn't shit like the bull cow, okay? And we need the shit. <laughs> you can't manufacture that. Um, and, and I'm thinking of all the best ways to be able to communicate that to a world that more and more uh, is disconnected from um, the earth and understanding its real need. We think things come out of a 3D printer. Uh, more and more. Uh, yeah, you can print a planet for yourself, but it won't be organic. Yeah, it won't grow, it won't grow anything, it won't <laughs> See, the problem anything. is, the problem is there are extremes. This is a challenge. When you talk about this, people will say, let's go organic, let's go vegan, let us go like how the Native Americans were, just love the land, be with it, don't disturb the land. But that's not going to happen. What is it that we can do is what we need to look at, not the ideal thing. Yeah. Ideal thing is an aspiration, but what can we do? So I am asking for, this is such a big thing, the world's economy and the whole movement, the world civilization is such a big thing, it's a massive ship. You can't just make a U-turn just like that, it'll capsize. Yeah. So all I am saying is, make a one degree turn in a committed way and hold it. See right now, uh, it is. It has been a continuous uh, morass for me to walk through. Yes. Constantly, people keep throwing this. Uh, what do you say? Um, uh, what are these lands? Marsh, yes. marshlands at me to wade through. When I talk about this, this is a little big farm somewhere here. You must see that, Sadhguru. You must see this farm. How beautifully they've done. I appreciate those guys. It seems they've made a documentary also fantastic, as an example. But what you need to understand is, suppose you and me. We have hundred, hundred acres. We did the ideal kind of farming. We are not here forever, we will die. Yeah. When we die, the next guy, what he will do is not in your hands, all right? That's what has happened to the land. Yeah. <laughs> hundred years ago, they were doing fine, yeah. now we have done this. So today I may be doing great, but tomorrow I will die and what will happen? So the most important thing that needs to happen right now, it needs to enter the policy of every nation on the planet. That minimum three to six percent Organic content must be there in agriculture land. How you get it, it's your business. Mm -hmm. Get it whichever way. We will provide you hundreds of ways in which you can do it. Do it your way. But if you want to own agriculture land, you must have three to six percent organic content. This is not even about you because soil is not our property. Soil is a legacy that's come to us from previous generations. We must pass it on like that to the next generation. You can't leave dead soil for future generations. Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, one of the things we, we talked about earlier is that, you know, different um, countries are coming with different resources. We talked about the, the disastrous effects of colonization on, on West Africa in particular. And if you have nations that are at a great disadvantage from being corruptly kind of having everything pulled, all the resources stripped from them, them getting to 3% might be a different uh, path than France, than Denmark. Other, other countries that don't have those obstacles. Yes. So keeping that in mind and the way we're framing it, we know that everybody's not starting from home base. Some people no. are starting on third base and people yes. are starting in the parking lot. Yes. Um, this is our goal and we can help augment the process to kind of create equal footing to be able to compensate for the changes you'll have to make. This is why I said depending on the latitude, yeah. depending on the type of land, soil, uh, economic conditions, cultural practices, taking this all into consideration, we are coming up with hundreds of ways to do it. Yeah. You choose your way as it's suitable for your land, yeah. or you invent your new way of doing it. Yeah. Do it whichever way. Only thing is, soil must be alive. This is our responsibility as a generation, to keep the world's soil alive. See, when we say, agri why I am focusing on agricultural soil, not on a rainforest or the ocean or whatever, they're all issues. I'm yeah, not saying they're not, they're all serious issues. But Agricultural land is one land which is every day tended to by human beings. Men and women are there every day. That land is in the worst condition, what we are tending to. If you want rainforest to be well, you don't have to do anything, just don't go there, that's yeah. all. Yeah. All right? You want to the ocean to be well, give it a two-month holiday. No fishing, no nothing, even maritime business. Just stop it for three days in a month, everything will bounce back. Do you understand? Yeah. Because nature has that power, but with soil, the land that we are tending to is in its worst condition. So what we are tending to, we can also turn it around. We can tend, we are tending to it in a careless way. We can do it in a caring way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
I'm, I'm thinking of the ways in which regular individuals and communities can best impact this locally. We obviously need it. We're talking about policy. We want politicians to be able to make it a priority for themselves. You have public land, you have private land um, with different needs. Um, so it's really about, it seems to be getting this uh, into the, com the political conversation so folks don't have to, um, they can feel like they have people who are really invested in the issue. The top three political parties in every country in these 192 countries, we are writing to them to include soil policy as a part of their election manifestos. Mm -hmm. In future, political parties must get elected because for the concern that they have for ecology. For this, we need to move the people. Right now, hardly two percent of the people like ecology, environment, this is all yes. playground for the rich yes. and elite who don't have to really, uh, you know, yeah, risk their lives. Social issues, yes, yeah. That's, that but is... the common people are completely ignorant. When it hits them, it hits them. Yeah. See, right now in United States, for example, food is thirty-three percent more expensive than what it was in 2019. Mm -hmm. It is at its highest price in the last six decades. In the last 60 years, this is the highest food price that you have seen in the United States. So who do you think is suffering most? Right. Those who are sitting in fine uh, rooms and t having tea and discussing ecology? No. no Those people who are completely ignorant of these things, it's hitting them, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. We just, I just um, concluded the first part of a project around policing and it's a very, very similar framework. We always, we consistently see working poor folks um, astonished and surprised when police get off for murdering people on television or politicians get away with huge corruption. How did this happen? Who is that? What is a district attorney? What, what is a grand jury? How did this happen? And we're always in the state of surprise because there is a don't understand how the actual underpinnings of it work. So you get caught off guard. It affects us, not, not, not the elite communities, but folks who are working poor. And it's a, for the exact same reason. We we want food is so expensive. That is the is so that is a guy who has to walk the street every day for his living. That is the guy who is going to be hit first in every way, exactly. whether it's food shortage or a bullet. That is the guy who gets hit. Yeah, so he's the one that needs to be most informed. Yes, um, because it. But who does it benefit for you to be ignorant to these issues? Um, those in power. So that, that's an interesting parallel. I think a useful parallel for folks to be able to digest. Uh, the importance and that just because you d you're not aware of it doesn't mean it's not happening. And it does require like everything uh, involving systems. See, you power. having a bulletproof home is not a solution. Right. Maybe it's a safety for an individual family, but it's not a solution. Solution is when everybody can walk on the street, you know, carefree. Yeah. That is a solution. Yeah. So, you accumulated a certain amount of food, you got a piece of land in Africa or South America from where you are every day importing food for yourself and your family. There are right. people doing that. Yeah. All right. That is not a solution that the world is able to produce enough food for its population. That is a solution. For that to happen, living soil is the most important thing. When you call soil dirt, we all become dirt bags, isn't mm. it? <laughs> mm. <laughs> because we are made of soil. Yeah. Yeah. Understanding the machinery, not just waiting for what it spits out at mm -hmm. the other end. Um, and you can't impact it if you don't understand it. This is all coming from a very goal-orientedness. How many tons have we produced? What is this? What is that? Where is the GDP? All this is fine. We need a certain commitment to the process, not just to the goal. Mm. I ideally, how would you... What would you like to see happen over the course of the next, let's say, even ten years? Let's not even go too far ahead. How do we envision this working out really well? See, I'm somebody who's... Uh, though I have my ideals, I'm a very, very super pragmatic person, yeah. all right? I believe if you make one percent change, one degree change in the course and hold it, committed to the change, mm -hmm. in some time you would have made a U-turn. You need commitment and patience to see that it is makes a U-turn. Mm -hmm. But if people have... Unfortunately, this is usually considered a revolution. Revolution means you want to turn things around like this. Well, it has never worked. It's only caused more misery to people. Maybe some glorious flags were flown here and there, yeah. but it brought enormous misery. More people died, more people suffered out of those things. Because sudden turns, unless if the small situations can be suddenly turned, Large situations cannot be suddenly turned around. Right. 
it needs to be held, the course must be held for the changes that we make. This is why I'm consistently insisting that it must come into the policy. Yeah. I make some change, you make some change, it'll be there in our lifetime and again gone in the next generation. Yeah, it's not locked in. Where, where do you anticipate the most opposition? So till now in the last two years, I've been talking to thousands of people, political leaders, influencers, business leaders, well, uh, all these UN agencies, scientists, till now not one person has said anything negative about this. They say, everybody says this needs to happen. So what I see is, everybody knows the problem. When I say everybody, all the influential segment in the world, scientists, politicians, bureaucrats, everybody knows what's the problem. They've been waiting to bell the cat. Who should bell the cat? They need some idiot to do that. Here I am. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you need an idiot to bell the cat because everybody knows the cat needs to be belled, mm -hmm. but nobody wants to bell it because they think somebody else will do it. I thought I should do it before I fall dead. Well, what we are doing right now in the form of conscious planet wouldn't be possible ever before because this is the first time we can sit here and speak to the entire world. There were no technologies like this. Even twenty-five years ago, this wouldn't be possible. Mm -hmm. Now. When we have the means to talk to every human being on the planet, now if we do not make the transformation, it simply shows that we don't care, isn't it? Yeah, that's the threshold. That's why education is so dangerous. If you keep it away from folks, we can excuse apathy. But once you have it, it's really hard to unlearn information. I certainly feel that way and, and learn that as a, as a history student and history teacher. Um, it empowers and informs everything. Mm -hmm. You can't, you can't unremember. Um, what you've experienced. And this is not new, we've done this before. The Mesopotamian civilization has done this, depleted mm -hmm. their soil and died down, Mayans have done it, Romans have done it, yes, uh, Greece has done it. Uh, it's happened everywhere. This is why India is very important, you should not skip India, I said. We've yeah, been farming for twelve thousand years, yeah. but we kept the soil rich. Yeah. Because the connection with the soil, even today, when a farmer enters his land, first thing is he'll bow down to the soil and then only step on it. Mm -hmm. Because that sense of, this is my mother, this is the yeah. source of my life, is still instilled in their hearts. Yeah. But uh, too much of lab education kind of destroyed it, but we can put it's this back. very real. Gratitude and, and a reciprocal understanding of... of um appreciation for the earth is... it's cultural and that's... See, human spread. beings are emotional beings, all right? Mm -hmm. If there is no emotion towards something, we will not protect it. Why is it that we will be willing to even die for our children? Yeah. Because of the emotion, isn't exactly. it? Exactly. And that's why we're willing to allow atrocities to happen uh, mm -hmm. and, and our earth gets stripped away because we we think about value and money more than, it, more than mm -hmm. anything else. But we can, we can reverse that. Um, I'm giving... My, my, my trip to India will be entirely dedicated to India. I don't want to squeeze <laughs> it into like three other countries. It's a, it's a massive, beautiful day. You must come when I'm there. Yes, please. Absolutely. <laughs> I can show you in India that very few people see. I can't wait to do that. Yeah, that's very, much, very high on my list. Um, you know, I, 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 th I think about a lot of the parallels in this conversation with just interpersonal kind of relationship dynamics, from our relationship to the earth. Uh, and I think about our relationship to each other, um, and, and we talk about like policy versus uh, a one-off. I, I, could, I could do a nice thing for you once, my wife, my girlfriend, my partner, my brother, I could do it for you once, or I can have an understanding of what we do and don't do out of respect. I just think there's a little bit of a, I just keep seeing kind of parallels in, in the way you live your life, which is obviously something you, you talk about a lot. Um, so these kind of guiding principles and how to conduct yourself, how to live with uh, 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 gratitude and calm uh, that connects directly, it seems, to the conscious planet. Essentially, uh, humanity. Yeah. We don't have to control our lives with morality if we have an overflowing sense of humanity, isn't it? Yeah. Because morals can be controlled by societies, morals can be controlled by the times in which we live, but humanity is a deep sense of empathy with life, which is instilled mm -hmm. within our making. So, it's best that we have a, a, an overflowing sense of humanity rather than trying to fix our lives with some morals which may work today and tomorrow it may turn against us. Exactly. Which is also something that doesn't have to be invented anew. It's how it's been happening for so long. Mm -hmm. We talked about 
um, the farming style. The, you know, in America becomes organic is a new thing. It's how it started, <laughs> right? When when folks first tell me came. what tell me what is not organic? Yeah, except the plastic cup in which you may drink. Uh, what is not organic? Everything in the universe is organic, all right? You create a problem and then create a solution, which is actually what was already there in the first place. We started eating organic and growing organic. And um, so that uh, I look forward to that cycle being really exposed. And it's about building that foundation, that, that, app, that spiritual foundation that will inform all of our behavior. Jesse, you're a leader in your community. I'm, uh, you know, I'm deeply invested in the African-American community's history, I've been, you know, I've... Uh, I'm talking about when I was 15, 16 years of age, I've read books on how the African-Americans came here, what happened to them. Uh, crying in my bed and reading the book, I mm -hmm. still remember that, mm -hmm. just reading that stuff. So I'm deeply invested in that, you are a leader in the community, it's very, very important, the African-American community understands that you are at a juncture of your struggle mm -hmm. where wisdom, patience, education, empowerment is the way forward. Because we honor the people who suffered in the past. Your fathers and grandfathers who suffered immensely, we deeply honor them. But your struggle is for the unborn child, not for the dead. It's very, very important. Yeah, the, the, our, our, our guiding principles and, and elders and the people, the women and, and men and however they identify that are, that are leading the fight, understand that. It, it's, it's, it's a consistent um, battle to uh, be able to communicate that to younger generations and in this technological era to communicate that to people um, uh, anew. But uh, at our core, that's why, that's, that's exactly the principles that that we live by and that we, that we fight with, we just... Reacting to... in anger is going to work against you. It'll push you back as a community. It's very important, this generation must empower itself with education, enterprise. Yeah, our core group, our, we understand that. And then, uh, you know, we're often um, um, projected uh, to be reacting out of anger, but most of the vast majority of the time it's reacting, we're reacting out of love. We're reacting out of love for ourselves that fuels our behavior and our movement, especially around policy, especially around feeding and, 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 and fueling people. Now why, I'm, why I'm saying this is, when you look back, mm. who cannot be angry? Of course. So that's why looking forward is important, looking at the children, looking at the unborn child. Mm -hmm. How do we pave a way that they don't even have to really be affected by what happened yesterday? That should be the struggle. I know that's in everybody's minds, but if you look back, anger will come. Mm -hmm. But we must look back with a certain sense of dispassion towards that and with great honor and respect for people who went through it as they went through it. Yeah. But we cannot fix the past, we can fix the future. Yeah, it is a very, it is a very fascinating actually juggling act to... You, you, you need to know your history and understand context, but you cannot be anchored Mm -hmm. by it. You cannot be weighed down by it. And that's a hard, it takes time to metabolize that information, right? Like to, it, to we've all, you know, we read and experienced these things and, and you, okay, this informs what's happening. Now I understand what that was referring to. Now I understand the origin of that policy. Now I understand why we live here. Now I understand why we eat this way, why we don't have any resources. Okay, I know that. I can just sit in it or it can motivate me all the more to sit upright and, and move uh, in loving awareness as to how we can make ourselves uh, uh, live in a better set of circumstances. Um, it, it just requires experience and time mm -hmm. and that's hard for folks to always have, right? Because No, uh, well, I'm saying this with a certain context yeah. that particularly the African-American community, we would like to offer tools for them and large-scale tools for individual people to see that their emotion, their intelligence, their strength, their energies are harnessed in such a way that the past wounds will turn into wisdom. Mm -hmm. No, don't remain as wounds. Yeah. When you have a wound on your body... That's the difference right there. Yeah. Yeah, use it to, you know, in some ways, A, you know, I've, I've, I've torn my ACL, right? You're, you have an injury, your body 
tries desperately to strengthen that area. It scars, it locks up so that it won't be wobbly. And I think that that comes to mind when we think about using your injuries and your experience to fortify yourself, um, not to let the victor be mm-hmm. the injury itself. Um, it's something, it's something, yeah, we have to continue to be conscious of and figure out oh, better are, ways to... Continue. We are willing to offer whatever services we have to, to those, uh, com- you know, those who are in that community, who are in varieties of disadvantages for pe- reasons yeah. beyond uh, their own, yeah. you know, their own doing. So we would like to offer this free of cost, the tools for self-transformation, which will harness their energies in a more creative way, in a more fruitful way than reacting in anger, mm-hmm. because that's costing a lot to the youth. Yeah, well, we, that's wise. We appreciate that. It's um, um, when you're, I just think of, you know, we're surrounded by, I'm wary, of, I understand. I'm, I'm wary of, um, use of the, of, you know, we're surrounded by so much and a victim of so much anger um, that sometimes if we're, we're, a, we're a mirror and we're reflecting it back, it's not actually our actual um, mindset. Um, and, and we receive that. We receive that because it is, it is an emergency. Mm-hmm. Um, and we need to be armed for the battle that, that, that's before us. So that's very much appreciated. I, I, sh- I want you to not to see it as a battle, but as a self-transformative process. Mm-hmm. Because if you see anger, resentment, hatred, these are poisons that we drink and expect somebody else to die. Mm-hmm. That's not how it works. Mm-hmm. When we drink it, it kills us. That's right. That's exactly what somebody else wants. Yeah. yeah. All right? Yeah, indeed. So the most important thing is that we transform this energy into an empowerment process right. for the generation that is there now yeah. and also for the future generations. Ensuring that a large number of uh, African-American youth are educated, empowered with en- power to enterprise, start businesses, do things, which will create an ecosystem where in a generation or two, there may be no such thing as looking at people on the basis of their color of the skin. if. They're everywhere in the services, in the production, Mm -hmm. in Mm -hmm. variety of things, in positions of power, responsibility. So, the color will not be the dominant force and it's such a silly thing because the color is not even skin deep. Yeah. (laughs) It's just the super surface. So, uh, my color is what I am because I can process sunlight better than you. Yes, exactly. (laughs) And that is a problem for you. (laughs) A power treated as a disadvantage. Um, Yeah. and Everybody is talking about solar energy. Yeah. We are harnessing solar energy <laughs> better than yeah. most people. Exactly, walking around <laughs> solar, pa- solar panels. Um, yeah, and regardless of how people view us, it will be armed, will be, will be fortified in a way that um, it doesn't stop our flow and our empowerment and our self-love and our ability to move in love. Um, that's, that's, that's the ideal, right? We don't necessarily need um, uh, to, to focus on how other people feel about us. We need to focus on how we feel and are able to have the mobility to grow. We cannot fix the past, but we can fix the future. Let's fix the future. Let's make it happen. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Wonderful.